Right? Okay. All right, today's lesson is about the ministry of Apollos. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 28, and do it some in depth. And um, it's about Aquila and Priscilla. They, they're in Ephesus, which is not in Israel. That is actually a Gentile area. Um, but they are there preaching, probably preaching the gospel, and they run into this man by the name of Apollos, and here's what happened, and here's what we can learn from this. Starting in verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, so we know that he's Jewish, okay? He's, his name is Apollos, and he is a Jew, born in Alexandria. Now that's not in Israel. Alexandria is actually in Egypt. So he was born in Egypt at Alexandria. Now there was this huge, li the ancient library of Alexandria that burned and that a lot of people are familiar with. So this was a fairly educated area. This Alexandria was a sophisticated uh, cosmopolitan type city that was considered very literate. And so this man was probably very well educated. An eloquent man, this also attests to the fact that he was probably educated and intelligent. He was an eloquent man. He spoke very well and mighty in the scriptures. That means he had studied the scriptures, what he had available to him, which we're gonna find out here in a minute was limited, but he studied the scriptures, he knew the scriptures, and he was, he was mighty in them as he had studied them and they were in his heart so he could easily speak them out of his mouth eloquently. Now, there's a lot of preachers these days that are very eloquent, they have this ability, they have their mighty in the scriptures, they've studied the scriptures, but they lack one thing that Apollos did. And in order to have a ministry like Apollos and be a, a man of God who was very effective, um, you have to do something more than just be well-educated, have an eloquent speaking style and be intelligent and be mighty in the scriptures. It takes more than that. There's an old saying that says, if a man has talent and drive, he will be a king. If a man has no talent, but he still has drive, he can be a prince. But a man that has talent and has no drive, he'll be a pauper. So you can have all the talent in the world if you don't have a certain amount of drive, you're not going to be successful. And now we know that Apollos had drive, because let's go on. An eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. So he was not from Ephesus. He came to Ephesus. So he was coming to the Gentiles, or perhaps the Jews, and he was preaching to them. Okay? He was preaching to them. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, so he had had some formal instruction. He had been taught in the way of God. And being fervent in spirit, now this is where a lot of pastors lack. Fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he, only, though he knew only the baptism of John. So his knowledge was limited up until John the Baptist. That's as far as he knew. But he could speak very eloquently about all the things up to and including John the Baptist. So he had a gap in his knowledge, and yet he was still very eloquent, and he was fervent in spirit. Okay, he was fervent in spirit. That's what a lot of pastors lack. They lack this fervency in their spirit and this willingness to go. Even though this man didn't have perfect knowledge, he was so fervent in his spirit that he wanted to go to Ephesus and preach what he knew. He was a genuinely attempting to convert people to God, even though he was not fully educated in, in the right way, which we're going to find out here in just a minute. He was fervent in his spirit and he was passionate. 
He was eloquent and educated, and he took all of that and he used it for the kingdom of God in what capacity that he had. A lot of pastors don't do that, okay? They don't do that because they, they, they're gonna, they wanna stay in their church. They wanna stay in one spot. They don't wanna go from place to place. And I don't mean going and preaching at Christian conferences where you just get pats on the back and you're sort of, no, no, no. This man was confrontational, which we're gonna to get to here in just a second. Okay, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So he went to the synagogue to speak to the Jews while he was in Ephesus, and he was speaking about the baptism of John, John the Baptist. John, what was John the Baptist's ministry? Repentance. He, this guy was boldly and fervently preaching a message of repentance. That's what John the Baptist preached. So he was saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what he was saying. That's what John the Baptist preached. He made this way straight for the coming of the Lord. So that's what this guy was trying to do too. Even though he didn't have the full knowledge, which we're gonna get to here in a second, he preached based on the knowledge he did have, right? And he was very eloquent about it, and he was bold. He boldly preached at the synagogue, and he was bold because he was confronting something. He was confronting sin. That's what you do when you preach repentance. You confront sin, okay? So that's what he was doing. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, now this was a husband and wife evangelism team. Priscilla and Aquila had a home church and they were out at the synagogue. What were they doing at the synagogue? You got to ask yourself, why were Priscilla and Aquila hearing Apollo speak at the synagogue? I'll tell you why. Because Priscilla and Aquila did not just have a home church. They didn't just operate in their church at home. They went out onto the streets. Apollos is a street preacher. Priscilla and Aquila were street preachers. They took their message out beyond the walls of their home, which was their church, and they went out to the synagogues to convert the Jews, to convert the Jews. That's what they were doing, okay? That's why they were there, and they heard him speak. They heard him. They took him aside. That means they spoke to him privately. They didn't call him out publicly and, and do like some people do on Facebook. You heretic, you're wrong, you're speaking, that's wrong, you're gonna go to hell. They didn't do that. They took him aside and said, look, dude, you're right on track up until this point, but let us explain what happened afterwards so you'll have the full picture, okay? They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately and corrected him and he received it. This is a humble man. Even though he was speaking boldly, he was a humble man. He was willing to receive instruction. Just as he had received instruction from the things he knew up until this point, he was willing to receive instruction so he could be more accurate in the way of the Lord. He wanted to be more effective, so he was willing to accept correction from someone who knew more than he did. That's a humble man. That's the way all Christians should be. That's the way pastors should be. If a pastor is saying something wrong, he shouldn't just stand up in his church and make him try to make him look like a fool in front of everyone. You should take him aside and explain the ways of the Lord more accurately, okay? If he receives it, he learns from it, he becomes a more effective witness. If not, right, if he had not received this, Priscilla and Aquila would said, okay, we're moving on. They just dust their feet off and move on. I think I think he could do a whole teaching just on Priscilla and Aquila, you know, being a team. Yes, you know, being a um, team. There's a whole teaching on that, which I might do later. Yeah. Um, because they were a husband and wife mm -hmm. team out on the streets. There's a lot of people that say women should not preach to sinners. And this is proof right here that they can. Okay. They work together as a team 
to instruct this man. Now the woman, the wife was under the authority of her husband. Yes. Okay. She was not out on her own without her husband's authority doing this, whatever. She didn't have her own ministry that she, you know, no, they had a ministry together. They were husband and wife team. He, she was the helpmate and they went out together and they preached. Women can preach to sinners. Okay. This is proof of it right here. Okay. Now, they explain the way of God more accurately to him. And then it says in verse 27, and when he desired to cross to Achia, so after he learned, he wanted to go someplace else. <laughs> he took this knowledge and went to another place. Oh my gosh, this guy is just out there preaching out on the streets to everybody, right? So this, yes, that's what you're supposed to do that's with the, the gospel. gospel. That's the goal. That's the goal. It's to go out beyond the four walls of the synagogue or the church or wherever and go from city to city, town to town, preaching the gospel. Fill That's what he was go doing. And pour out. Yeah. And Apollos later became a more central figure in the church later on. You're gonna, because there's a whole teaching you do about Apollos' life. But this is the very beginning of when he was actually introduced to the church of Christ. To the, you know, so he learned more accurately. He took this lesson to heart. He's probably, now this doesn't say how long this was. They explained it to him more accurately. And then it says that he desired to go to somewhere else. That might have been days. It might have been weeks. might have been months. We don't know. We have no idea. So he probably took some time with them to learn from them. And once he learned this, because he was an intelligent man and he, does, he was fervent in spirit, he wanted to learn because he wanted to pour out. Then he went to someplace else. After he got instructed, he went out with this new information, this new instruction, and started giving out the gospel more accurately because he wanted to be more effective, okay? And when he desired to cross to Achia, the brethren wrote, the brethren probably being a, a Priscilla and Aquila. They probably wrote a letter and explaining this, okay? Exhorting the disciples to receive him. So they probably wrote a letter ahead of him and said, please accept him. He is now part of the body of Christ. He's a, he's a good evangelist, right? When he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. So he went someplace and he greatly helped the Christians who were at this other place. Now, how did he do that? Well, it tells you how he did that. He greatly helped those who had believed through grace for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly. Oh my goodness, he opened up a can of worms where he went. He vigorously refuted the Jews publicly. That's called confrontational ministry. That's called confrontational evangelism. It has a place in the body of Christ, as it states right here in the book of Acts. He went and publicly refuted the Jews and told them, repent and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out and times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He told them they needed to be converted from the old covenant to Christ. That's what he was doing. Kind of like us witnessing to the Jehovah Witnesses. Exactly. We, we go out and we publicly refute the Jehovah's Witnesses. They we, publicly, we publicly refute the Mormons. We publicly refute the Jews. We publicly refute the Hindus and, and the Muslims and the agnostics, and the atheists, and the homosexuals, and the fornicators, and the adulterers, and the thieves, and the pro-abortion murderers. We go out and we publicly refute the people that are against God, against Christ. That's what we do. So they have a form of godliness, but they, they deny the power thereof. We, we do exactly <clears throat> what Apollos did right here. And the, the Christians that were there in this location said they were greatly helped by him because he did this. 
he went out and confronted the Jews and refuted them vigorously in public. He didn't just sit there in his building and run his mouth. He didn't sit there on Facebook and run his mouth. He didn't sit there on YouTube and only run his mouth. He went out publicly and refuted the people that stood in the way of a gospel and gave them the truth. And he greatly helped the church. That's what we're supposed to be and doing, folks. What one will send a thousand to apply it to? We'll send ten thousand. Right. It. So it has an effect. It has an effect. It sure does. Okay. Refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He used the scriptures. He used the word of God to show that Jesus is the Christ. To the Jews. Now, the Jews, I'm sure, is using the Old Testament. Today, we use the Old and the New. So you can actually preach the gospel from the Old Testament because that's pretty much what Apollos had at the time. Because at this point, they had not put together the New Testament. They only had the eyewitnesses of Christ, the apostles going out and teaching everyone. It was more of an oral tradition for Christ, and the, the scriptures were still at this point relegated to the Old Testament. So he was using the Old Testament to preach Christ, Jesus, as the Messiah, which can be done. He did that with the Jews, okay? So if, he can, if you can do that with the Jews from the Old Testament, how much more so can modern Christians today do this from the New Testament to the Gentiles? How much more can we do that? We can. And we need to go out and publicly refute anyone that stands against God with both the Old and the New Testament. All the scriptures, you know, are inspired by God and they're there for, for instruction and for reproof and all of that. And to exhortation. Lift, exhortation or lifting people up. And so... The scriptures are there for all of that. And we need to go out and use those scriptures to refute those publicly who stand against God, who stand against Christ. That's what we need to do. This is a good example of a man who immediately, even though he didn't have the full knowledge, he was still out doing what he could. And then he got corrected. And then he went out with that knowledge and that correction. He went out and did it right and was greatly effective at it. And if he can be effective only having the Old Testament, how much more effective can you be, O oh Christian, if you have the New Testament on your side? How much more effective can you be? So we are without excuse. This man went out and did what he did with limited knowledge to the best of his ability. What are you doing? What are you doing for the kingdom of God? Are you just sitting on your butt in your pew? Are you just running your mouth on Facebook? Or are you actually out there in the world publicly trying to convert people to Christ where the rubber meets the road because the devil is out there and you need to be out there battling against him? So anyway, that was the... What happened to the, the guy message. that buried his talent? What happened to the guy that buried his talent? God said, you lazy and wicked servant. See, there are several things that you could hear on the day of judgment. You could hear, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. You could hear, you lazy and wicked servant. Or you could hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So which one of those do you want to hear? Only one of them is going to be good. So you better hear the third one. And the way to do that is to take what God has given you. Don't bury your talent and go out and make a profit for God by going out and preaching publicly. What it, in whatever capacity God calls you. You don't have to do it my way. You need to do it God's way. However he's calling you to go do it, that's what you need to go do. Whatever kind of ministry it is, there's many different ministries and many different activities within those ministries. You, that activities, that means doing something. That doesn't mean just sitting on your tail end saying, oh, we don't believe in works-based salvation. No, but you should be believing in salvation-based works because how are they going to hear without a preacher? They don't have to 
You know, and they don't have to even do it the way you do it. No, always, they can do it the way God tells them to do it. I always loved it when, you know, when we had friends that could sing that, um, you know, it's not a talent I bear. Right. <laughs> but Why but, can't but you go out and play music on the streets? Right. I, you know, I, I love it. I know there's there's several of my Facebook friends that do that. They go to gas stations and, you know, and... And, uh, and go and to just, street corners and just play the guitar. And lift and up the name of Jesus. Lift up the name of Jesus. With the talent that God has given There you him. go. That can be done, and, too. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. Handing out, folks, handing out tracks is so easy, even a Christian can do it. Okay? Right. You can hand out tracks. You can talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. You can go out and play music. You can do homeless ministry. You can do nursing home ministry. You can do hospital ministry. Now, speaking you, of, you can do street going out to gay pride events. You can do, go to the bars. Go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means you are commanded by Christ. It's not a calling. It's a commandment to get out of your church and go out and preach the gospel there was, everywhere. There was a man that we met one time. Uh, at a he he was in a mall and he would go to the food court, and he would just sit patiently at the food court. And he because that's it, all he was allowed to do. Right. Had and his it, tracks laid out in front of him. That was in New Orleans. Right. And he yeah. and uh and people would come by and and take a track and or, he would talk to him or he would or have a convert. You know, they'd start up a conversation. You know, and, and he was um, but he was, yeah, he was faithful with with. He with, did that six hours a day, seven days a week. When he you know, and I, I don't know if he had any kind of physical disabilities that kept him from walking or whatever, but he I don't know, or it's you just know, that he, the mall was his mission. Field, yeah, that's where he felt, and called. that's where he felt called to go. Now you know, now it's a command to go out, but where you go and how you go is a calling. Do you remember that that young man that um, in Alaska? That uh, he used to go to the grocery stores and yeah. and preach. He would go to the grocery store and pass out tracks and talk to people. Until <laughs> so they'd come and throw him out. And yeah. go to another one. <laughs> yeah, go to yeah. another one. Then he go to another yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, any place could be. You know, Walmart. Walmart you know? anywhere. Laundromats. You go to a laundromat and you wash got your dirty clothes, laundry to do. Wash your clothes and and hand out tracks to people and wa and wash your clothes and talk to people about how their hearts can be washed. And clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. You can take anything, anything like that, and flip it around and use it for the kingdom of God. And, and people, you just need to be creative. You need to be imaginative. Pray and let God give you ideas. You may not have a good idea on your own, but God will give you an idea. Uh, you can take gospel tracts. You don't even have to hand them to people directly. You can do indirect handouts. You can take gospel tracts and leave them in places where you pe know people will find them. You can go to the bookstores and take books off the shelf and put a track inside of it, put the book back on the shelf. And then when somebody buys it, takes it home, there's a track in it. No matter you can what, do that. no matter what you do, though, uh, and no matter how lightly you do it, you can expect some, at, at some point, at some time, that there opposition. might there might be opposition. I mean, and that's just part of the deal. That's just yeah. You're gonna have to weather through it. It is, and Jesus it's not that you're doing through. something wrong. It's just that the, the world hates the light. The darkness hates the light. And so that's to be expected. You're going to find opposition. You're going to get opposition. But that opposition, well, you know, there's an old World War II saying. Uh, with the Army Air Corps, they used to fly over and bomb targets. They said, you know you're over the target when you start receiving flak. Because when you're over the enemy's target, they're going to shoot back. So when you're being effective for God... You're going to get resistance. Of course you're going to get resistance because that's the nature of spiritual warfare. And that resistance is designed to make you stop, but that resistance should make you press in, press harder, press forward. Because that is, that is evidence, that's backhanded confirmation from the enemy that you're doing the will of God. And that is what you need to focus on. You need to focus on doing God's will in spite of all of that. And when the enemy comes at you, say, thank you, Lord, for the blessings of the opposition. Because I know when I'm persecuted for righteousness' sake, for your name's sake, I am blessed. Thank you, Lord, for that blessing. And because you're going to get blessed. You remember that man that just totally come undone that one time in front of the bar when all I asked him was, was if I could talk to him about the Lord. And well, you said, you said... You said this, you said, Jesus died for you, or were you willing to live for him? And he lost his mind. He did, he that absolutely. Question. 
Jesus died for you. Are you willing to live for him? Just that one question, and he lost his mind. And the son wanted to beat me up. The son, because you made his drunken father angry by asking a question. You know what? That's on them. That's not on you. You didn't say anything wrong. You didn't ask the wrong question. You asked exactly the right question I, because obviously it brought some. And I never got conviction. to say another word because he was just like a volcano <laughs> erupting. But he got the conviction on his heart that you were assigned to deliver, and that was success. Right. That was success. Our goal. Other people may look at that. Is to plant to water so God will give an increase. You know, all that's all it is. We, our goal as street preachers is to bring conviction on the heart of the sinner, to put him in a position where he must make a decision to either rebel further or repent. To put him in that position where he has to make that choice, where he's gonna repent or rebel. You illustrate, you use the law to illustrate their, their necessity of Christ. You use the law as a tutor to bring them to Christ. We preach their condemnation under the law because that's where they are. We tell them where they are and where they need to be. When you look at a map and you're trying to figure out where you need to go on a map, what's the first thing you do? You orient the map. You figure out where you are so you can figure out where you want to go. If you want them to go to heaven, you have to orient the map for them. You have to show them where they are. Where they are is in sin in the world, and they're destined for hell. Uh, that's what. That's a natural that's, statement. That's, that's John three eighteen, right? Yeah. He who believes is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Not our so judgment. You have to show him that he's at John three eighteen, and God gave John three sixteen so that he could get saved and what you need and, and then what what you need is in the book of acts where it says repent therefore and be converted so your sins may be blotted out in times of refreshing may come from the presence of the lord that's in that's in acts chapter 3. so you they're they're at john 3 18 they don't need to go to acts chapter 3. that's where you're trying to take them you're trying to take them to repentance so that they can repent and give their lives to christ so that's your goal as a preacher out on the streets and you're just using the word like Apollos did. He was mighty in the word because he was fervent in spirit and because he had taken that fervency and he had educated himself on what he could and then he went out and preached with the full good intentions of his heart. And then God, being the gracious God that he is, sent two messengers, two witnesses. By two or three witnesses, the thing is established and these two witnesses spoke to him and gave him the correction. He recognized that because he was familiar with the scripture. And then he took that corrected information and he went out and preached the gospel more accurately. He was very effective. That's that. By, by two witnesses. By yes, two witnesses. Yeah. That's right. That's two great. witnesses. Yeah. And so he uh, did that. Matter. <laughs> he did that and he took that out there and he went out and preached the gospel more effectively and he refuted the Jews vigorously in public. That's what Christians need to do. You need to go out and refute those who don't follow Christ vigorously in public. Who's, who's the more loving, the one that says nothing or the one that says something? Yeah, right. You know what? People always want to say you're not loving, but actually, oh, no. you know, I'm more the loving. Most loving. I'm thing, more loving. You're most, more loving. The most the, loving thing you can do is to tell a sinner they're in sin, why they're in sin, and how to get out of that sin through Jesus Christ. That's the most loving thing you can do. But you got to give them the first. The doctor has to give the diagnosis before he can give the cure. you got to orient the map and show them where they are before you can show them where they need to go. You've got to do the first things first, and you use the law to do that. Use the law as a tutor to bring them to Christ. So the law has a function. That's why it came before Christ to convict you of your sin, then Christ came to give you the cure, to give you the, the remission of sins. That's why, that's why you know, those, those people that say they're Christian and they go to the gay pride to hug, hug the sinner. All the and, 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 that does them no and, good at all. All that does is enable their sin and further cement them in their sin and just lead them further into hell. Those are the people that are driving them away from God. 
because they're not driving them towards repentance. Anybody that drives people towards God will always go through repentance to get there. That's why I always like that analogy that that when you when you see somebody on the highway to hell and you, you know the bridge is out, you know they're you headed warn from, them the bridge is out, take the Jesus X. But you, you don't say you don't wave to him and say, I hope you have a nice trip. Have a nice trip. Love driving. you. Stop and let me give you a hug. And then they drive off the as, bridge and go to hell. Right. No, you tell them to get off at the Jesus exit. You warn them about you the wave, thing. You jump up and down. And you <laughs> scream and you wave signs and way. use bullhorns and banners like, don't go down the bridge. Get to the Jesus exit and live. Yes, take the Jesus exit. And live. And live, yeah. yeah. Choose this day whom you will serve. But, but the world wants to, and even even the so-called church wants to point to the person hugging, you know, thinking they're oh, more that's loving. loving. Oh, yeah, that's love. Here that's love. love. On them. No, we're you're just not here. loving them. You're not. You know how many times have, have we heard love. that? That is a pretense of love. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. You go hug homos, you're betraying homos with a kiss. You're betraying their souls to hell by hugging them straight to hell is what you're doing. If you do not go out there and tell them to repent, you are leading them to hell. How many times have we been, I remember I got the maddest, maddest at so-called Christians because I was at an Easter event that they were putting on and I was passing out tracks and they were encouraging people to give them the tracks so they could toss them. Yeah. Or I was and they went around and picked up the tracks off the windshields of the cars and threw them away. Right. We're trying to leave. They're, they're doing their little Easter egg hunt thing. I'm just here to love on people. Oh. And we're here to preach the gospel. And they stood in the way of them receiving the gospel. The most important thing about Easter is not some stupid bunny. It's the fact that Christ rose from the dead. What a great opportunity to preach that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and rose from the dead to show that you can be resurrected into life if you follow him. What better opportunity is there than that? And yet these people were going and standing, uh, supposed Christians, and standing in our way. I went That's past, the agent of the devil. I went out from passing out tracks to, to thoroughly rebuking them. Thoroughly rebuking them. And I called their pastor at their church afterwards, and he was mad at me, not them. He defended them. I said, you defended you're defending someone standing in the way of the gospel. But you know what? He what must have repented at some point because they didn't do that event. They didn't do that event ever again. Because uh -huh. when I told that pastor, I said, you do this event again and I will show up with 30 people. I will show up and you, you just think you were mad about this time, buddy. I will show up with five bullhorns and, and a thousand gospel tracks. I and I will, I guarantee you, the, the, the people... <laughs> They will hear the gospel, whether you like it or not. I, I went I was, quietly passing out tracks, oh too. Oh, my gosh. To I preaching loudly as I could for hours because I was so upset at them taking my tracks yep. and tossing them. Yep. Yeah, and they didn't want, taking them off the cars that I had put them and on. And next year, they yeah. did not have that event because I told them, Ooh. if you do this again next year, I will show up with five bullhorns. And thirty people, and because that would right, you righteous act. anger. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was righteously angry, and I told him. I, now, I, when I called him, I didn't start chewing on him. I called him and very gently discussed about what was going on. He got mad at me because well, you were interfering with our event. I said I was not interfering with your event. Your event was inside. We were outside the event trying to hand out tracks before they went in or when they were coming out. And then we put them on the windows, and your people went and took the tracks off the windows. And he said, well, maybe they didn't know what was on it. I said, yes, they did, because I gave them one. I said, here, read it. All it is, it's, a, it's just a gospel track, a basic message of repent, turn to God, do works befitting repentance, like Acts 26, 20. I said, that's all it was. Very simple, totally biblical, no denominational stuff in there. Like, it wasn't a Baptist track. Or it we, wasn't weren't, we weren't inviting them to our track. church. No, we were not inviting them to our church. We no con <laughs> we're not trying to take them to our church. None of that. We want them to come to Christ. And he still got upset with me doing that. 
and said, well, we're not going to let you do it next year. I said, well, next year, we're going to bring five bullhorns and 30 people, and we are going to blast the gospel to everybody going inside, whether you like it or not, pal. That's exactly what we're going to do. I, we will light you up. And he did not have it the next year. They canceled it. They didn't have it because they did not want us to do that. And um, But... Hey, if I don't want churches to go out and just do Easter egg hunts on Easter and think that they're that's all good with God. And that's not, not evangelism. That's not evangelism. That's that's nothing. That's that's just like over here just to be your friend. You're being a friend of the world is what you're doing, which makes you an enemy of God. Right. You cannot be a friend of the world. You have to stand apart. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. We are called to be separate from the world. We are not called to be like the world. We're not called to play footsies with the world. We're not called to be friends with the world. It says if you're friends with the world, you're an enemy of God. We're not called to be that, and we can't do that. Can't act that there was, There's a whole groups. Uh, I remember this in Alaska, too. There are whole groups that they... The uh, churches that go to Alaska to go to the parks uh, in the summertime of Alaska just to play with the kids. You know, it's like, well, that's great. You know, it's great. You know, a lot of these kids don't have any adult supervision. You know, they don't have anybody that. But what are you doing for the kingdom of God? Right, but you. Are you so, trying to lead them to Christ? Are you giving them the truth? What's the purpose of you doing right. that? Right, yeah, what is the purpose of that? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, if you go out and just feed people, if, if all you're doing is, if Jesus fed 5,000, but he gave them the gospel. He I, gave them the truth. If you just go out and feed people, never give them the gospel, you're nothing but a taco stand on the road to hell. That's all you are. You are yeah, doing no good for the man. kingdom of God. <laughs> you're not doing any good for the sinners. All you're doing is trying to make, and it's all about you because you want them to think of you as good people, nice people. We're Christians. Look how nice we are to you. That is all about you. That is purely selfish. Your goal as a Christian is to throw self in the trash. Your self doesn't matter. You hung that on the cross with Christ. You're dead to yourself. You're out there trying to preach the gospel and you're trying to give them the truth. You have give, you don't care what they think about you because what they think about you doesn't matter. It's what they think about God. That's what matters. I'm all, I'm all for feeding the homeless, but I think you got to feed them both ways. You, gotta you have them. to. If you're gonna, it, it's okay to feed the homeless if you're feeding them the truth. If you're not feeding them the gospel, then you're That's doing the nothing for them. You're not doing them any good. You're wasting your food is all you're doing. You're wasting your money and you're wasting everybody's time because the, the, the only, the God's word does not come back void, but your food comes out nothing but poop on the other end, okay? That's this, that is the product of what you get feeding the homeless. You get big piles of poop at the end. That's it. That's all you get. But, that's but when you feed them the home. gospel, somebody might get saved. And even if they don't get saved, God is still glorified because if they receive the gospel and they reject it, God is still glorified in his justice. So you, God is glorified either way when you preach the gospel. But God is not glorified when you feed a bunch of homeless people and they just poop it out. It's just a waste. You're just wasting it. Yeah. There's just no, it's just all worldly stuff. And, and I've heard this a thousand times. We got, we got thrown out of that outreach at that church, that park, when that church, that San Jacinto Assembly is God. San Jacinto Assemblies of God. Oh, don't say the name of the church? Oh, sorry, too late, already said it. Well, so there was this church who will remain nameless from that point forward. They just said, oh, we're just here to love on people. And I was just trying to hand out gospel. That was 10 years ago. I'm sure they've grown since then. I hope so. I hope I'm so. I'm sure they're doing good. You know, one of our one of our good friends goes to that church, and I know, I know. And hopefully he, he has turned them around. He's doing a lot of good. I hope he's doing a lot of good because 10 years ago, they, they threw us out of their outreach because we had the audacity to hand out tracts. And there was another church that John, the one you're talking about, that now goes there and teaches there, his own church that he went to, his own church that he went to, they had a trunk or treat out there as a substitute for that was Halloween. a different one. But they were not preaching the gospel either. All they were doing was sitting around handing out candy 
and, and they were just introducing them to their church. That's it. That's all they were doing. They were inviting them to church. They were not inviting them to Christ. And he went out and handed out tracts, and they threatened to trespass him from his own church if he handed out, handed out gospel tracts. That's, that's the thing is, is that, um, you know, one of, one of somebody that we, we know from a long time ago that used to always say this, and I think it's a true statement, that you know what you win them with is what you, you keep them with, and so you want to with them, win them with the word. You don't want to and win the other stuff is, and hot dogs. Other stuff is just bonus, but you know you want to win them with the word because that's that's what's really going to truly keep them. I don't them have a problem world. with using bounce houses and hot dogs if you're preaching the gospel when they get there. Okay, if you're giving them the gospel by whatever means you bait them with. Is okay with me because you're fishing for men and I understand you got to use bait I don't have a problem with the bait but you got to be giving them the gospel or you're not fishing you're not all you're doing is just feeding people right. and you're not doing them any good they're, they're walking away with the same level of no knowledge of God that they walked in with and that should not happen that should not happen if they come into contact with a church they need to leave with the gospel of Christ. I sure wish we even still, if they reject it. I sure wish we still had that snow cone machine. I mean, that was a great tool. Oh yeah, we we used that as bait. We gave away free snow cones in, in uh, New Orleans at that housing district, which was um, Iberville. That the when New Orleans was the murder capital of America, Iberville was the murder capital of New Orleans. They they basically had a murder there every week. Every week they had a murder at this one housing complex. One a week, somebody got murdered. And, and, and so we went there with these, the snow cone machine started and we went with a limited number of flavors and we made up all these bottles of syrup and, and we gave out what they called, what they call, um, uh, well, shaved ice, but they call it snow cones. And so we gave out snow cones to the kids and the kids lined up. And then we handed out tracks. We talked to people one on one about Christ, but we used it as a, as bait to bring people in so they could witness to them about Christ. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Now, I know, you know, like the college, the college people. You know, we go to the college that that used to pass out the free co coffee in Alaska, which you know, coffee's mad. big in Alaska, but they they don't ever give the, the gospel. Not, they you know invite people to come to their. Bible study, it's, I don't know. But they don't give them the gospel while they got their attention right then and there. Right. I mean, because if, if you, okay, if you invite them to a Bible study, that's great, but what about them right then and there? What if they never come? What if they never come to the Bible study? They just walk away without Christ? See, and they were mad at me because I would go out there and actually preach the gospel. Oh, they get mad. They, they pack up their coffee and leave. They would pack up their coffee stand and leave. They were so angry that I was out there preaching the gospel when they were just trying to hand out coffee. How dare I do that? But see, this is the modern American church. We don't want to offend anybody. And the gospel, the gospel offends people. Offends. Yeah, it the does gospel. offend. And I don't care if it offends because they're going to be a lot more offended when they get to hell and then you served them coffee, but you didn't give them Christ. And they're going to say, why didn't that guy tell me about Jesus? You know? Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to be person. that person standing there going, "Yeah, Lord, I gave him coffee, but I didn't give him you." I mean, my goodness, where's the profit in that? What happens to coffee when you drink it? It goes into the urinal. <laughs> you feed the homeless; <laughs> it goes into the toilet. You feed, you feed, you give them coffee; that goes into the toilet too. Right. But the gospel stays in their heart, so that's what you want to give them. That's what they need. They need the bread of life. They need the living water of Jesus Christ more than they need. You know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Christians need to be giving every word that proceeds from the mouth of God in addition maybe to the bread of the world. You know, it's okay to give them bread, but did, they need the bread of life. Yeah, Christina, when you give out coffee, when you're preaching uh, the gospel to the people waiting in line to go into the stores on Good Friday? I didn't give them coffee, but... Or not Good Friday, but um, I uh, preached to them on Good Friday because they're all standing in no, line. It's a captive audience. No, no, it wasn't Good Friday. It was it was um, oh, Black, no, Friday. Black Friday. Black Friday. 
Black Friday when they're all standing in line waiting to go in Best Buy to buy $100 TVs on sale. I'm out there giving them a message about the real gift of Christmas is Jesus Christ and how many people leave that gift unopened. And that's the message I give. And it's a very gentle message it's because they're not in sin. They're standing out there waiting in line to buy a TV. It's not a sin to buy a TV. But you just want to tell them, look, the real gift that you need to give for Christmas is Christ. The real gift you need to receive at Christmas is Christ. Because Jesus was born into a world of darkness as a, as a child of light. And that's the real light of the world. And it's... The, the thing of you know about this teaching with Apollos, I mean, you can go out there and be like Apollos and and preach, and there's even if you don't have complete knowledge, you don't have to be a genius with the word. Just go out there and you know by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony is what it says. Go out there and just give them your testimony and give them the blood of the Lamb. Know the basic gospel and your testimony. Bingo, you're armed for the streets. Go out and start with that. Now, as you do preach on the streets, you're going to get better and better. And you're going to study your word because you constantly get challenged. Most pastors that get behind a pulpit, they can preach. But most of them can't do one-on-one -on -one witnessing out on the streets because they don't know how to handle challenges. People, you've got these atheists and agnostics that come up with some very intelligent challenges. And they don't know apologetics enough to be able to respond to those challenges. But when you're out on the streets, you learn that stuff that's, the that's, hard way. That's why I like going so much with you as a, as a team is because if I'm talking to somebody and I, you know, and they have a question that, that challenges me, I could pawn them off on you. I, I have done that. Maybe there's that an thing. atheist, come talk to him, you know. <laughs> I've done that. Remember the college professor? Oh, yeah, I've had some great, matter of fact, that one college professor in New Orleans that you pawned off to me, told me it was the best conversation you'd ever had with a Christian, came up and hugged me afterwards, came up repeatedly and shook my hand. He would leave and he'd, he'd start to leave, he'd come back and then want another question. He'd leave and he'd come back and then he hugged me at the end and said it was the best conversation he ever had. And that lady yeah. in, at Halloween in, in um, Salem, she said, Remember? She said that. Oh, and she said about you. She said, Oh, I love to debate with you. You're very knowledgeable, but I love your wife. Yeah, so it's good to have, it's good to be a team. It's good to work as a team. We work together as a husband and wife team. And there are people you reach I can't, people I reach you can't. And so if I'm talking to some young lady and she wants to talk about women's issues, I go, Hey, babe, come over here and talk to this young girl. She's, you know, this is going to be uncomfortable for her to talk to me about this. Let her talk to you. So then a woman can talk about girl, you know, women's issues with you and feel more comfortable opening up to you. And so we reach more people as a team. I'm sure that's what Priscilla and Aquila were doing. They're working together as a team. And that is, that is a good message, you're right, in and of itself. And I'll do some study on Priscilla and Aquila and read up all the scriptures about them where I find it and then put, a, put another teaching together on that. So I guess that's we're done for the day then, aren't we? Yeah. You gonna post that on Facebook? Mm-hmm.